All right, we're going to give the people what you want, and you want mucus. <laughs> Let's Ooh. go. <laughs> Ooey this gooey. Is the mucus episode of the IBS Freedom Pod. I don't know why I'm singing, but I am now. Ta da! It scat, took 167 scat. episodes to have a <laughs> sing song intro, but I'm glad we're here now. And we I had am, Amy dancing. This was a whole, a whole thing. It was a production. Well, shoot. Un- un- well, I don't know. I think we topped ourselves already. Do we just wrap it here? We call it <laughs> yeah, here? I think so. I think yeah, we can't uh, top That's this. it. <laughs> <Ta-da>. <laughs> well, guys, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about mucus. Amy, you want to fill in the, tell the peeps why mucus matters. Let's start with that. Why should they care about this episode? Why should they not just like fast forward to the next one? Yeah. So mucus, it's such a fun topic. I think that it's definitely a little gross for people, but I'm into it. I'm kind of into the gross. It's necessary, right? It's, you need it. You do. It's this, I I think of, you know, everyone thinks of the gut lining. In my head, I feel like at least when I first started getting into gut health stuff, I saw that single layer of cells and it looks so delicate. And you're like, oh man, this seems like there's not much protection there with the, the actual cells in your gut barrier. Oh, contraire, um, mon frere. Right, exactly. So what do you have that's sitting on top of your gut lining cells is your mucosal layer, which helps to protect that delicate barrier and keep microbes and uh, food and, and, you know, things you don't necessarily want to interact um toxins things like that you don't necessarily want to interact directly with the gut barrier so to me again it's this like shield this gooey slimy shield that helps protect the gut lining and it also provides a a great environment for the microbes to live and it's almost a habitat for them to live in yeah and in a food source so it's so pivotal to keeping the the gut barrier balanced and healthy um so yeah i I think it's such a i'm glad we're doing a breakout episode for the mucos the mucus um i i think it deserves it it does deserve it deserves our admiration and love and -hmm. frankly a lot of the things that our listeners are doing right now are degrading their mucus lining and compromising their gut barrier and they might not realize it Exactly. Right? So that's a big part of this too. But um, so for those of you who are audio only right now, you're missing out. But the people mm-hmm. on YouTube can see I pulled one of the paintings down from my wall behind me. And yeah, it's like you've got this cornucopia of critters up in the intestinal lumen. And that's where the food is. That's where most of the microbes hang out. And then depending on where we're talking about, I guess we'll talk about the colon here. We've got two layers of mucus. So there's a really thin, loose layer of mucus on the outside. And there are critters that live in that mucus. And some of them degrade it, like Bacteroidetes species generally do. And famously, Acromancia likes to live in the muck. Mm. And then there's a really dense, thick layer of mucus. And that's basically impenetrable by the microbes. Like Mm. basically nobody lives down here. And then the next thing you have is the intestinal lining. And then the next thing you have is you. Right. It's like your, your immune, immune system, your, your right. bloodstream. It's it's the gate open to your body after that point. Right. Yeah. And it, it's always fun <laughs> to acknowledge that when you, when you, something's in the gut, the gut lumen, I should say. So, you know, when you eat something and you swallow something and it's, there's the food's not necessarily in your body yet, which is a weird thing to think about. Um, your GI tracts a tube essentially. And so the, the space in the middle of the tube is not necessarily in your body yet. Um, so your body needs to protect itself to figure out what's going to come in and out. And the mucus barrier is a really good protect protective later protective layer to help with the process of of you know keeping you safe and keeping the environment stable yeah 
Well, a couple ways to conceptualize it. Uh, when I had a brick and mortar office, you know what prop I would have in my desk drawer when I was mm. trying to make this point to people? What was I that? would have one of those. See, I don't know what they're called, though. It's the thing that you get at like a carnival or a fair, and it has colored liquid and some little little doodads on the inside. And it's it's a tube in a tube. And when you hold on to it, you can kind of like... Oh, for crying out loud. What is the stupid thing called? Hmm. Like, if you saw one, you would know what it was. Okay. Oh, my God, Amy. Um, If I get a second, I might try to run over into my drawers and find one because I used to have one in my brick and mortar office. But it was like this tube thing and you hold on to it and it kind of slips through your hands like a bar of soap almost because it's Mm. just like a tube inside a tube full of liquid. Right. Okay. Okay. I'm not articulating this well because I don't know what the damn thing is called. Some of you at home are thinking right now, oh, I know exactly what that is. Right. Oh, um, another way to conceptualize. If you had a balloon or a beach ball that was only half inflated and you took your fist and you pressed your fist into the balloon. Right. Right. So that like the balloon is kind of wrapping itself around your wrist and your arm. Is your hand technically inside the balloon no no because you you remove your hand and it goes back to the same shape it's just you're making that like pocket shape when you do that right so similarly yeah the stuff in your gut is actually not technically in your body yet it's when it crosses the gut barrier which includes the mucus lining and the barrier cells that we all think of and it gets into your bloodstream or your lymph, like that's where we say, oh yeah, it's inside of you is once it's absorbed. But this, you know, one final metaphor to conceptualize this, this is the way I I usually teach it in FODMAP Freedom is it's like you're trying to protect the contents on the inside of your house. And you have the walls and the doors of your actual, like you have the structure of your actual house, right? And that would be analogous to the epithelial cells. Mm -hmm. But then oftentimes you have something else on the outside of the walls of the house that's also protecting you, like a fence. Mm -hmm. And I liken the mucus layer to a picket fence. Right. It's like, okay, like you've got the picket fence first, and that keeps most of the bad stuff at a distance. Mm -hmm. And then by the time it gets to the actual house and something is banging on your door, you really, really, really hope that it's only good things getting to the door versus just letting anybody and anything come over to the door and knock away. Right. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. Um, and I think just bringing it back to IBS and SIBO, the people that we work with, you know, in doing my book, it's really interesting because there does seem to be a pretty strong link between uh, mucosal immune activation and IBS and SIBO. Now that now that can sometimes lead to something like a leaky gut, but it doesn't always. It's not always leaky gut. Um, so, but I do think it's really important to understand that again, what's happening in the mucosal layer and like the immune responses and things like that seem to be highly correlated to to. IBS, SIBO, that sort of stuff yeah. that we that we talk about all the time. And, and like you said earlier, a lot of the strategies, such as, you know, limiting fiber, um, reducing diversity, are really going to affect the, the thickness of the mucosa, the immune responses happening in the mucosal layer, um, what microbes are growing which might support the mucosal layer. Like there's all these interactions that start to happen when um, fiber starts to get depleted and nutrients in general get depleted. Um, That can lead to some of that like inflammatory type responses in the mucosal layer. Yeah. Yeah. It's again, I, I think the multitude of ways that people are accidentally shooting themselves in the foot with regards to this, I I think can't be underplayed. So for example, you know, going back to narrowing the diet and narrowing diversity, 
So there's the microbial piece of this for sure. But even just nutritionally, like, Mm -hmm. all right, get, get your RD hat on firmly, Amy. So I had, I had written down a bunch of notes because I did a mucus series for my YouTube channel a couple of years ago. And I referred back to some of my notes from that time. And I, I don't have the citation listed for this one, but one of Mm. the many things I had written down was that the mucus layer is about 80% carbohydrate. Yeah. Well, be thinketh if you don't eat carbs, you might have a hard time building a carbohydrate based mucus layer, right? I just throwing that out there. But another thought too, and a lot of these are oligosaccharide type carbs. Well, what does oligosaccharide make you think of? FODMAP? Right, exactly. Or like fermentable exactly. oligosaccharides, disaccharide, yada, yada, the whole acronym. So similarly, I really hypothesize that now I don't think I've seen papers indicating this yet. Mm-hmm. But understanding that the mucus is made up of 80% carbs, and a lot of those are oligosaccharide type carbs, I bet if you restrict oligosaccharides in your diet, that might translate to not only dysbiosis, which can cause mucus layer degradation, but also just you wouldn't have as much of the fuel to build the mucus in and of itself. Um, yeah. One one more too, just food for thought, and then I'm going to kick it to you, is that um, all of these units are attached with disulfide bonds. Hmm. So that you also get this layer <laughs> of people who are doing a low sulfur diet because they think they have hydrogen sulfide SIBO. They may, they may not. I'm not I'm not confirming or denying that right now, but I think there are a lot of people doing a low sulfur diet erroneously. And I think that it's probably doing more harm than good when they're using it for more than like a week or two at a time. And I've met many people who are doing a low sulfur, low FODMAP diet right? all at once. And they do that for months, if not years. And it's like, Ooh, man, you're going to have a hard time making mucus. So Anyway, yeah. yeah, kicking it to you. Well, and I think I think it's really interesting, the carbohydrate and the sulfur points you're bringing up. But I even think more broadly, you know, when you start being depleted just across the board, one, like if fuel is low in general, your body's going to be using up the carbs for other things probably. It's not going to be prioritizing mucosal layer more than likely would be my hypothesis is like, okay, we, we don't have anything to build up the mucus. We're using everything we have. So your body's more in this catabolic state where it's breaking things down and it doesn't have uh, resources to build things up. And I think that that happens with lots of my clients who are basically undernourished across the board. And then I, again, I think that there's a lot of elements of certain micronutrients that probably play into things. Um, some that we might not understand completely, but like a, there's a lot of nutrients that are involved with like, you know, uh, in the barrier function and things like that and mucosal function and like IgA production and, and things like that, that are going to be important with how the mucosal immune response is functioning. Um, So again, I think you can't underestimate the importance of overall nutrition to building that layer and keeping it healthy and not inflamed. Yeah, well, and kind of to your point, I'll just be a little bit more pointed with it. Even just ignoring the carbs, ignoring the sulfur conversation, even if we go back to just calories. Right. Right, it's like if you have a limited amount of ATP at your disposal – what is your body going to prioritize? Keeping your heart beating, keeping your lungs breathing, or like fertility and hair growth and mucus production. Right. Right. It's, it's kind of a no brainer. So even just being undernourished from a calorie perspective could play a huge role, let alone once we get into calories or cutting out whole groups of things like FODMAPs or sulfur. Um, and you're right, there's, you know, we could rattle off any number of nutrients and how they're needed by the immune system or the nervous system. Because here's right. a wild thing, too. One of the things that I, I was bringing back up when I was going back through my notes, there are some papers that indicate that 
the number of goblet cells in your gut, and therefore the amount of mucus you can produce, is regulated by the autonomic nervous system. So interesting. Yeah. Oh, wild. man. <laughs> right? Like that just opens up this huge can of worms of, okay, autonomic nervous system, rest and digest. I guess I have to gargle. JK, LOL. You got to go back and think about vagus nerve and like connection and happiness and bringing mm-hmm. joy into your life and, and like that sort of stuff. But also now you need to keep your nervous system healthy. Well, your nervous system really appreciates good blood flow. So like iron, copper, B6, B9, B12, you start getting into blood sugar regulation. You start thinking about just how the nervous system in general really appreciates vitamins and minerals and good levels of blood sugar and healthy fats. And it's like, oh, you really probably do need all of the nutrients and all of the macros to make this thing happen. Yeah. Well, and uh, again, like it's interesting that you bring up the nervous system because I think, you know, the nervous system and the vagus nerve is really there to just bridge communication and to like assess the environment. So I'm sure like the nervous system, like you said, is super important to be like, hey, we need more mucus, (laughs) you know, let's upregulate cells that do um, that you know, help produce more mucus. So like, it makes total sense because really like the nervous system's just like how the control of everything, right? It's in control of everything. And it's just like a network of communication where, um, you know, the brain can start interacting with the nerves and things in the gut and assess the environment and and things like that. So it does make us, everything's connected. (laughs) Like it's just crazy when you start going down some of these, these, um, rabbit holes. But I, I think it's good to start to, just that, you know, if you're not nourished and you don't, you're not connecting and you're not focusing on a lot of the unsexy basics, you're not necessarily going to have a healthy gut. And part of that is that your mucosal lining is probably not going to be overly healthy and thick either. Yeah. Um, just one of many things that are going to go awry. Right. Right. Um, and again, I, I think just another for the millionth time plug for the unsexy basics that people are probably like we get it people but it's on, just folks. again it's like writing my book's been so interesting because again it's to me the more and more i dig into um the ibs and SIBO space the more and more i think this is like diet and lifestyle a, a dial and lifestyle issue more than anything else mm-hmm. now again there can be other things like you know antibiotic use and different things that that play into stuff but again it it is interesting how huge and i think majority of people focusing on the core elements and getting really good at the core elements seem seem to make the biggest impact versus the fancy schmancy like gut supplement or yeah so yeah Yeah, and, and it's you know it's funny because Again, this is just another topic where we could easily branch back out into the unsexy basics for the whole episode. But like, you know, even something like sleep, oh, right? Yeah. Okay. Are you sleeping? Are you sleeping at a fairly regular interval? I mean, not only is that going to be huge for the gut brain axis and the nervous system health side of it, but also there's this thing called the microbial clock. Yeah. And the microbes get their circadian rhythm information from us and our behavior. And I kid you not, I just called a patient out on this yesterday because I was looking at his chronometer and I kid you not. I, so I looked at the food first and he was not eating enough calories. And I, that was the first glaring obvious thing. But then I paused. And I was like, what the fuck, what is going on here? He was logging everything at like 1.30 AM, 4.30 AM, 4.48 AM, 3.30 AM. Th- and I was like, why are you up? <laughs> and I called him out on this because it's like, meanwhile, you know, he's he's a good kid, but he's talking about, oh, do I need this prescription and this prescription? Do I need like a vagus nerve stimulator? And I'm like, bro, <laughs> you need to yeah. sleep right. at a regular time and eat more. It's really not that much sexier than that. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Man, it's... Uh... It's, it's just, uh, again, it's, it's just, I think more glaringly obvious, the longer we do 
some of the stuff. Yeah. Because again, we just see time and time again, there's usually a glaring thing that we're like, I know you want to go this way, but like, let's circle back to these three things. Yeah. Um, but I think another thing dietarily, which we definitely have touched on, is the fiber um, element of keeping the mucosal lining healthy. Um, I, I still remember hearing, uh, I think Justin Sonnenberg, who's a researcher. I remember listening to a, he was, must've been on a podcast or something, but I was listening to it and he very like in the interview was like, if you don't eat things that support your microbiome, like they're going to start eating you. And it was like the first, it was a very, um, mind blown idea for me. I was like, oh, that makes kind of sense when you think about how, you know, you need fiber to maintain the the mucosal layer, mainly because the goblet cells are fueled by things like butyrate and short chain fatty acids that keep them healthy, that help promote mucus production. Um, it, so again, it, it's it seems like if you start really depleting the fiber in your diet, the, the mucosal layer is going to become depleted and thin. And, um, you know, that's not necessarily going to help fortify that barrier that you really want to be strong and healthy and um, thick. You, you want a thick mucosal layer. And you want it, it to be thick, girl. You want a thick, thick, a thick girl mucosal lining. <laughs> Well, and yeah, and to go back to your point, I might actually have the exact citation yeah. that was used. So this is the one that I reference pretty regularly in my stuff, like when I do webinars and stuff. It was published in Cell. I think it might have been a 2020 paper, but I can't swear to that. The title, A Dietary Fiber-Deprived Gut Microbiota Degrades the Colonic Mucus Barrier and Enhances Pathogen Susceptibility. That last part, mm. super important. So here are all these people, right? And they're chasing SIBO and they're chasing candida and they're trying to kill all these boogeymen and pathogens. If you don't have a mucus layer, they're going to get in and they're going to take hold so much easier versus if you had that separation, if you had that picket fence between you and not you. Right. And here's something wild too. Now, again, I'm laughing at my own note-taking ability back because I didn't, I'm not listing the actual articles for some of these quotes that I pulled, but here's something wild too. This paper said, despite the, uh, so this is not the cell paper I just named. This is a different paper, but I don't have the citation for some reason. So just deal people. Um, so the quote though I, that I pulled Despite the traditional view of mucus as a simple physical barrier, multiple studies from our lab suggest that mucus can directly suppress the virulence of potential pathogens by changing their identity from harmful pathogens to host compatible commensals. Holy shit. That is so cool, but also terrifying because again, if you're eating insufficient calories, if you're too low carb, if you're on the low FODMAP diet or a SIBO diet for a prolonged period of time, if you're cutting out sulfur because you were told that sulfur is bad or whatever it might be, if you're doing these things dietarily that are thinning your mucus lining and you're causing dysbiosis and you're thinning out that mucus, you're literally taking the crew of bacteria that you have and you're making them more nasty and virulent. Right. <laughs> you might not have to kill anything. Right. You might just need to transform them from foe back into friend. Right. Right. <sighs> shook. Oh, I'm shook. I know. Are the kids still saying saying shook, by the way? I, I think feel like so. that was like 10 years ago. I think so. And I okay. I, I know again, like no cap. Can I use that here? Yes. No cap. Yeah. Wow. Look at you. <laughs> are just... we still doing the thing where we bring some some? I think slang? we are. I think we're yeah. This is our new one. You're, you're, what were you telling me? There was like some slang oh, term. She ate. Oh yeah, she and ate. And left no crumbs. Oh yeah, my. that was the last one. <laughs> yeah, that's And hilarious. if you want to diss somebody, you could say, oh, she thought she ate. Oh gosh. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> Brutal. I know that is out of control. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, 
I think, you know, and, and we talk about too, how from a fiber standpoint, how broadly most people think they're getting more fiber than they actually are. Um, what was it like only 5%, but 67 or 70% yep, exactly. think that they're yep. getting enough? 67% of Americans believe they are getting <laughs> enough dietary fiber, but only 5% actually are. So yeah. there's 62% of y'all that are delusional and yeah. need to have a little come to Jesus moment. Yeah. And again, you know, it's interesting because I think some of the people that we work with, I think most of the people that I work with are under eating a little bit. So maybe that depletes their fiber more, but then they're maybe scared of fiber on lower FODMAP or eating a very narrow diet, which limits their fiber. Um, But I would say majority of the time when I look at someone's diet, having like sub adequate fiber is fairly normal. Um, Typical. 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 I would say. It's not Um, normal, Amy. uh, Sorry. Normalize healthy nutrition. Yes. Got started. Is uh is tip uh, the lower fiber is definitely typical. Uh, you know, we've talked about recently we, we should do an episode on fiber. I think we were talking about this too. There's been a few cases where people have been eating like a wild amount of fiber too, which I think can be problematic as well. Yeah. Um when you start kind of getting into the like <laughs> just slightly under a hundred grams or like, you know, unint- and a lot of times it was unintentional, but you know, and you a lot of times it's vegans who do this. Yeah. It's interestingly enough. I've had a few people more recently, not vegan. One client I remember she was going to a pelvic floor therapist and the pelvic floor therapist was like, you need to up your fiber, but I don't think was like monitoring her fiber intake to begin with. And so she was adding, you know, like wheat bran, like, I don't know if it was powder. I can't remember exactly what it was, but she was supplementing with a bunch of fiber and it was just like taking it really high. So I was like, let's just remove the supplements, like the supplemental fiber and, and see how you do. And that kind of seemed to help. But, um, then again, I had another guy recently who was just on a very narrow diet and was eating the same, like, couple foods in really high amounts. And they were fiber. I think it was, like, oatmeal and um, Green popcorn. Green beans, I know we've talked about that Oh, yeah, before. we talked like, about uh, – there was a client that did that, too. But I think this guy was more, like, oatmeal, um, popcorn, but in really high amounts. And it, so, like, his fiber was pretty high, too. And, and lowering it seemed to help with, like, hypersensitivity and things like that. So – We'll have to do a whole fiber episode, but typically people are falling more on the low end. And again, you have to wonder, you know, stacking on top of the narrow diet, the narrowness of the diet, stacking on top of like low fiber, maybe low calorie, like you're stack, like you said, stacking all these things that just start to really deplete that layer. It, it's no wonder again, that people get stuck for long periods of, the, of time with IBS and SIBO symptoms and feel like there's no way out. It's because your, your body's primary defense mechanisms are usually down for the count or not online. And I think the mucosal layer is such a key one. Well, and here's a point too. Um, I think we've talked about on sleep episodes before how your body needs to stabilize blood sugar throughout the night because you're not eating in the middle of the night. And the way that your body does that primarily is through cortisol. And you secrete more and more cortisol as the night goes on. And it peaks first thing in the morning when you wake up. If that first fail safe fails you, your next line of defense is adrenaline. And that'll wake your ass up. So sometimes right. people who wake up and they're like, whoa, I'm like super awake. It's like, yeah, it's because your blood sugar has been wonky and you can't stabilize your blood sugar throughout the night. Or maybe you're super, super stressed or your circadian rhythm sucks and your cortisol's all over the map and you're unable to stabilize your blood sugar. So you're, you're going to your second line of defense. Similarly, look at it this way. Your first line of defense against ingested critters or your microbes we could say secretions are first, actually, right? So like stomach acid, bile, mm. enzymes, we'll say that that's the first one. But what is your second line of defense to keep the critters away from the freaking house? 
it's that picket fence that I just talked about, right? If the picket fence fails and weird things are getting in the house, and now instead of having like one telemarketer per month knock on your door, now you're getting like 57 telemarketers all day, every day, right? That's right. how I'm, that's how I'm envisioning lots of microbes, not all super friendly, good microbes, right. like knocking at your door. If that happens, what is your next line of defense? Now, it depends on like what all you have in your home. Some people could go full on like commando, but maybe it's a dog. Maybe it's some other type of self-defense to get those people the heck away from your house. But similarly, if sub if a lot of stuff, not all of which is friendly, gets through the mucus and it gets to the intestinal barrier, your next line of defense is your immune system. And you know what happens when the immune system fights off critters for you? Inflammation. Right. That's that's all it is. Inflammation, how it's typically talked about, almost always loosely translates to immune activation. Right. Well, your immune system is activating because it needs to be active because right. there all- are critters that it needs to defend you from. Yeah. And I, I feel like it, it would almost be equivalent to like a high amount of force. Like you have some things like maybe if things start getting in where like, maybe you had like, I feel like it's a little bit violent to think about, but like pew pew, like a little gun out the window or something as things no, that's are- what I was going to say. I didn't like- know if it would get censored on YouTube or something. So I refrained for that. Oh, a yeah. bazooka. Okay. Let's pretend that the person inside the house that's trying to defend right. themselves, let's pretend they're sitting on their couch, couch with right. a bazooka. Right. And they're pointing it out the window. They're getting ready to aim fire. Right. And yeah, like, would you rather shoo those people away with a decent fence and gate? out in your yard? Or do you really want to use the bazooka? You're going to get collateral damage if you do that. And I think again, like someone maybe having a pistol or something that could like target the person or sorry, not the person, the microbe (laughs) target the enemy that's coming in, I think is totally different than like being so overwhelmed, like by an onslaught of a lot of things where you're like, I just got to take care of this. And so you, you do the bazooka and maybe you're in the house. So you blow up a part of the house in this whole process. So there's all this collateral damage from the immune response, which again, like you said, inflammation. And again, I, I think inflammation is a good thing. Like the, the body's trying to protect you, but you know, it's not necessarily the type of protection that's not going to come with some negatives. Um, <clears throat> so, it, yeah. It, it, and again, you can start firing maybe at microbes that are good too. Like when, when you're getting kind of onslaughted with different microbes, um, the immune foods. system gets overwhelmed. You and can again, start reacting there, to foods. Right. If there's a degree of inflammation because your immune system's attacking things, I don't think the immune system can really navigate things super well. So it might not be able to identify, like you said, what's friend versus foe. Um, so yeah, it, it it gets really messy quick, I think is is how I would term it. Yeah, kind of chaos. And and again, it's like picturing, okay, if you live in a neighborhood and you get one door to door salesman or one, I think I said telemarketer before and that that would be the telephone. So that's not right. Uh, But you know, like, say you get one door to door salesman, or Girl Scout or whatever, knocking on your door once per month, normally, it's very easy to manage that situation, open the door, talk to them for a minute, decide if you want to do business with that person, and then send them on their way. And then you close the door. Versus again, if there's 57 people all on your front lawn, and they're all screaming, trying to get your attention, and some of them look scary and some of them don't. And some of them, you're not sure. Like, again, that's like threat level midnight. You're right. just going to go into super panic mode. And that's where this imaginary scenario, that's where you're going to get the bazooka and just take them all out at once. Right. But you're going to burn the grass. You're going to burn down the wall. You're going to take out the door. You're going to you're gonna do a lot of collateral damage. Mm. So it's like, which do you want to do? But To take this metaphor one step further, I will say it's not the fault of the dude with the bazooka that you did not provide adequate wood to build the damn fence. Right. It's not his fault. 
he wasn't in charge of the feds. He was in right. charge of holding the bazooka and waiting for shit to get weird. <laughs> He's doing his job, arguably. So everybody gets all pissy at their immune system right. because they're inflamed or they have autoimmune disease. It's like, man, your immune system's doing the best it can. It's right. just chaos right now. You need to have the bricks to build the house. You need to have the door to make the door. You need the f- the fencing materials and the paint and the whatever and the post hole digger to actually put up the damn vents. But again, I, th- I think that by the time people are listening to us, we're kind of beyond that part of the conversation <laughs> right. because it's like, okay, my fence was demolished 10 years ago. My door is now a shack and it's just, it's barely hanging on by a thread at this point. And the guy with the bazooka has called in his bros and now he, there's right. like 20 guys with bazookas <laughs> destroying stuff further what do I do? So maybe this would be a good point to kind of pivot over to the what the heck do I do now conversation. Right. It's like almost an unhinged militia. Uh, yeah. At this point, it, the the immune system becomes. And again, I it, it's such a great question because, again, so often we're digging out of holes, especially when we first start working with someone. And, and again, I, I think that you can rebuild the house. I think you can rebuild the fence. So again, I don't want someone to feel all doomsday. Um, But I think it's so important to focus on the fundamental stuff. And maybe you do do some things that kind of help reduce inflammation or that help with gut barrier function, like supplementally or something like that, you know, that help with regulating that a bit. But that's not necessarily going to be a long-term solution. I think so many people jump on things like glutamine or, you know, butyrate and all these things. I think they're, I think they're good options and they could potentially help. Um, But again, if you really want long-term healthy rebuilding to happen, you need the fuel, you need the bricks, you need the wood and you need it, which again, usually amounts to nutrition and working diligently to get nutrition back to where it needs to be working diligently on your nervous system, working diligently on the the fundamentals. Yeah. Well, and, and we could go into the nutrition conversation in a minute, but theoretically run with me on this. What if we had somebody who had a good grapple of where their nutrition is mm-hmm. and they know what they need to do? But genuinely, honest to God, every time they try to reintroduce a FODMAP or a CARB or sulfur, they get bad symptoms. Are there any cheats or shortcuts or band-aids that we could use? I was actually going to suggest that butyrate could be one because butyrate and short-chain fatty acids do promote mucus lining health in addition to the barrier itself. So it's kind of like helping the feds and the wall of the house simultaneously and the inflammation. I'm not going to say it's it's the cure-all for everybody, for everything, but I think that you actually would be hitting all three of the targets, like the guy with the bazooka, right. the wall and the door of the house, the structure of the house and the fence, all with one. Potentially. Yeah, it's like almost so, like a, a contractor that helps with each each one. Like, okay, yeah. I can source your bazooka, man. I can source your, yeah. your bricks. I can source your wood. Um, yeah, I mean, I think butyrate can certainly be a great supplement um, to help build tolerance, to help with inflammation, like you said, to help with the mucosal lining and the gut lining. So again, I, I think that those types of types of tools can be really helpful if you're in a total bind like that. Um, but the important thing is like, that's not necessarily the long-term solution per se. Like you still need to be doing some of the other things. Yeah. And I'll throw out two more just for funsies before we get into the nutrition side of it, which is uh, vitamin D and vitamin A. Yeah. Also help regulate the mucus barrier and can help, again, with the inflammation, help with leaky gut, help with the microbial kind of interface. So I think, you know, if if you're sitting here thinking, I really can't do these nutrition things, I would explore one or two or all three of those things, perhaps. Now... Let's, so nutritionally, again, let's say now that we have somebody who's really in a bind and they, they feel like they can't make progress, um, maybe a good place to start is if they're low in calories, maybe just having them eat 
a little bit more of the foods that they're currently eating? That's usually what I do in general. Like I try to not focus. Well, again, it's hard because some people might need to diversify a little bit to get more in. I mean, it depends on where someone's starting. If someone's starting with five foods or something, it's like you almost have to diversify to ensure they can get enough. How many more carrots can you eat? Right, Right. exactly. But I think if someone's kind of eating still a really limited diet, but you can get the calories up with that amount, I think that that should always be the first step and the the highest priority. Um, Because again, as you increase calories, you shouldn't have a bump in fiber, typically you're going to have a bump in all the nutrients. So like if you're focusing on fiber, but your calories are low, it's not going to be as much like bang for your buck, so to speak. Um, so focusing on calories, I think is, is number one priority. And I think once that gets situated a bit more, you could think a bit about macros, you know, do I need a protein Um, what do I need to do there? But then I think from that point, you know, probably diversifying and focusing on fiber a bit more, trying to ease into more fiber rich foods makes sense. Well, yeah, like reintroducing FODMAPs, for example, right? If you are low FODMAP, and again, it, it doesn't mean you go from low FODMAP to eating a regular diet right away. Some people need to go really slow, right? And, you know, maybe you start experimenting with just the sorbitol and then mannitol and then you move over to the fructose or whatever order it might be but maybe you do a really structured reintro and even if there are a couple of columns in that FODMAP acronym that you can't do right away maybe you could get one of them back yeah and that that would give you some diversity some new fibers some new vitamins and minerals and some more sanity probably because restrictive diets just suck yeah um, but yeah, like that's that's a possible idea too. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think sometimes people get so overwhelmed by where they're at, it it keeps them stuck. Like it's like, oh man, I, I know I need to do this thing, but it feels so overwhelming. Um, but if you can just start with something really small, um, you know, I'm again, also for the book, I'm researching habits and like some of the habit amounts that some of these habit people will tell you to do as what is small is like one push up a day. You know, like that level of small is still better than what you have done without with doing no push ups at all. So again, if you start with, you know, a little couple of beans or something in your in a soup, like, okay, like, hey, you had three beans, like, that's amazing. Um, You know, start you, it's, it, I think the more that you can just continually, consistently push forward, the better. But I think what happens is at times is some people get so overwhelmed with the process that they just remain stuck. And, you know, trying to push through a little bit and finding bite-sized ways that you can um, move forward, I think is really helpful. Yeah, well, bite size, maybe pun intended, maybe not. Right? I didn't but, intend it, but I'm happy that I said it. But you'll take it. Right. Um, yeah, you know, here's here's another thought nutritionally too. And I hesitate to share this with the majority of our audience, but I think that there are going to be some people for whom this is helpful. Um, doing a fast for like a day might be a little bit of a reset. Now, disclaimer... If you are not eating enough calories, if you're undernourished or if you're losing weight, do not even think about fasting. No, the answer is no. But uh, if you are reasonably well-nourished, you're not dropping weight unexpectedly, fasting can have, again, anti-inflammatory effect. So that's good for the guy with the bazooka. And it it actually favors the, well, here, this is a quote that I pulled too. Periods of fasting favor the survival of organisms that could degrade mucin, the true residence of the human microbiota, and inhibit the survival of luminal species, which are said to be more transient. So you are temporarily reducing the number of species that live in the middle of the gut, or not the number of species, but the number of um, bacterial cells in the lumen, 
when you're fasting because there's not a lot of food for them to be working on, but it actually can promote the survival of the mucin, live like the, the critters that live in the mucus. And yes, they degrade the mucus layer and they eat it, but also they stimulate its production. So they're helping to regulate the mucus lining and the mucus health. They're not just degrading it. So for all that that quote mentioned degrading mucin, I don't want people to panic. Um, yeah. But fasting is another thing that can help boost things like acromancia and help increase this health. And for some people, especially if they have a lot of more inflammatory symptoms, just, you know, a day of not eating can go a long way. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. Yeah, I think I think you're right. You know, you'd want to make sure you're at a good nutritional spot to do it. But yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have had some clients that incorporate some degree of fasting and, and you could do it too. You know, it doesn't have to be so extreme. Um, I think there there's been some studies where there's been some benefits where there's like 13 or 14 hours from like overnight to morning. Um so, you know, point being like maybe doing a little bit of fasting from night to bedtime, like eating a little bit of an earlier dinner and then allowing yeah. for a little bit more fasting. And if you can get all the calories in during the day, but you know, you could do something similar to that where it's not so extreme, even as like 16, eight or like intermittent fasting, but you could do something like that where maybe you try to give a little bit more time from dinner until bedtime, or maybe you wait slightly longer to eat breakfast or something, whatever seems to work better. Um, but well, I do think you, you can think of, uh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, you could do some of that stuff without tons of effort. Yeah. Well, and if you think about it too, you're, you're not actually saying anything crazy at the end of the day. Like if, if you have, again, if you have dinner on the earlier side, I'm not talking the blue hair special at the Goldman Corral. You don't have to eat at 4.30, but maybe you eat between five and six, right? And then you go about your evening with no snacking, nothing caloric, and then you go to sleep and you wake up and let's say you have breakfast, let's say you ate dinner at five and then you had breakfast at seven. Well, there's 14 hours right there. Right. And really, it just translates to eat dinner a little bit earlier, and then don't snack and don't eat anything after dinner. Right. That's all. Like, so, you know, it's it's not anything monumental. And you know, it's funny. One of the things I really like about Michael Pollan uh, was when he did his book, Food Rules, and he gathered, he he crowdsourced nutritional wisdom from his audience and a lot of it, he was saying, is like stuff that your grandma probably would understand or right. stuff that your grandma might have told you. And uh, I remember vividly, my my mom still talks about this, that my grandparents, w- who were a bit overweight, diabetic, uh, they both lost like 30 pounds with basically no effort. And the only thing they did, and this was you know back in like the 70s or 80s, the only thing they did was they stopped eating after dinner. Yeah. Because very frequently they would have like a bowl of ice cream or a bowl of cereal or a little snacky snack. And the only thing they did was cut out the evening snacking and they both lost like 30 pounds and felt great. So, you know, it's, it's, again, it's unsexy. You didn't need to wait for 2024 for the IBS Freedom Podcast to tell you that. Like my grandparents figured that out in the 70s or 80s. Yeah. But, um but yeah, that that could even promote mucus barrier health too. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Now, perhaps we could get into a couple of advanced strategies. Whoa. Yes. So again, there's a hierarchy, right? Like if you're really, really compromised and you're in a pickle, you're in a deep hole, maybe vitamin D, vitamin A, um, you know, butyrate, butyrate kind of stuff would be helpful. If you're in a moderate hole, right, a a small pickle, not a giant pickle, if you're in a small pickle, then maybe it's just a matter of eating more calories, diversifying your diet a bit, reintroducing a handful of FODMAPs, like testing some of these things nutritionally, pushing through the mild symptoms and having faith that you're doing the right thing and you're going to heal your body and build the damn fence again, like, you know, sleep, blood, all the other stuff we talked about. 
But uh, probiotics are yeah. freaking fantastic for mucus lining health. And this is a topic where it it's really weird to see this discrepancy. The research is very, very clear that probiotics are wonderfully helpful for both IBS and SIBO. Right. But then the common dialogue in like the SIBO Facebook groups and the dialogue that we get with patients and clients, I think, is typically that people are terrified of probiotics. Right. And, and I'm not going to say that every single probiotic is going to be the best thing ever for each individual. Like you might have to try a few to see which one really sits well with you. But I, I mean, there's too many to even scroll through. I pulled so many quotes in my research on that initial series I did about probiotics regulating the expression of MUC2, MUC2, which is one of the pathways of mucus production and stimulating mucus synthesis. And again, so let's see, we've got lactobacillus paracasei, we've got a bifido bifidum, acromancia, that's the obvious one. Uh, this one just says bifido species. It's broadly, here's a different bifido dentum uh, or dentium, maybe. Another one, another couple just saying bifido species in general will do this. Um, you know, another another group, including short chain fatty acids, indole producers. So anyway, the sky's the limit, man. Yeah. But it it very much feels like probiotics are a good solution for this. And it's this isn't gonna fit in with the analogy perfectly because I don't think this is going to make sense, but I'm going to try to make it oh, make anatomical sense. I can't sense. wait for this. Okay. We have the guy with the bazooka. That's the immune system. We've got the walls and the physical structure of your house. That's the gut lining, the epithelium. You've got the picket fence, and that's the mucus. Well, now imagine that there's a tree outside of the picket fence, and you tied a couple of dogs, like guard dogs, Dobermans, to those trees. There's your probiotics. So it's mm. another layer. Now, I, I acknowledge if you have dogs, in, <laughs> you're going to put them on the inside of the fence, not the outside of the fence. That's where it doesn't make sense. These are but, guard dogs. Yeah, but like there's guard dogs that are protecting you before anybody even looks cross-eyed at your damn fence, let right. alone the physical structure of your house, let alone the bazooka. Right. right? Well, and it can uh, kind of allow you some time to rebuild too. Yeah, I mean, you put you put 10 dobies out front uh, or, you know, 10 roddies or whatever it might be. You put some good guard dogs out, on the outside of that fence and you're going to scare away the 57, you know, weird people who were at your door, <laughs> right. at least temporarily. It'll buy you some time to rebuild right. the freaking fence. Right. I agree. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think another um, thing to think about is polyphenols. Um, you know, polyphenols are going to help the mucosal layer in a number of ways too. And so just trying to incorporate <clears throat> like dark fruits or I, I always use fruits cause I just think that they have like, it, it's funny. There was a, there was a paper that looked at the amount per gram per a hundred grams in pol of polyphenols for each food. And I think maybe like oregano or something like that was the highest, but who's going to eat a hundred grams I do of, every day. Oh, my God. Okay, sorry. I, my apologies. But basically, if you do it like a nor what a normal person would eat, the foods that are going to have the highest amount of polyphenols are the dark berry type foods. And again, I, I always think of just people demonize fruits, but they definitely typically have a higher amount of polyphenols. Um, I feel like people are kind of on board with berries because they're low glycemic. Okay. So I've, I have worked with people who are doing low carb, but they're like, but I do have one cup of berries right. every day. And it's like, okay, what if we just gave you some pineapple? Okay. Something wait. crazy. You Can know? I also go on a little bit of a tangent? <laughs> so sure. my husband came home from his doctor's appointment yesterday and I guess like his doctor lost a lot of weight in the last six months. So he was like trying to give my husband advice about like what he should eat. And he told my husband that he, that he eats... He takes a little Dixie cup and just eats berries on his way to work. 
That's all he eats for breakfast. And That's then breakfast? my husband's like, well, I like bananas. And he was like, if you're going to eat a banana, you might as well just eat a potato. And like, I'm like, well, what, what does that mean? Like, are you demonizing bananas now? And I'm like, what's wrong with a potato? So again, I, we, we had this conversation. I'm like, your doctor sounds like he gave you the worst advice on what to eat for breakfast. Well, it sounds like he's sipping the Kool-Aid <laughs> well, of Well, and it's like, that's not, it's the same thing we, we talked about a few, um, maybe, maybe it's in the functional episode, but just like, sometimes I'll see doctors posting their meals or like people posting their meals. And I'm like, this is not an, like having berries for breakfast is not an adequate breakfast. Uh, I'm surprised that he's even doing the berries for breakfast, honestly, because at that point you're going to stimulate your digestive juices and wake up your stomach. And then you're going to be more hungry after that, like if it was me, I would rather just do an intermittent fast right. and wait until lunchtime. Well, and honestly. it's, it's always cracks me up. Cause like, I'll talk to my husband. He's like, yeah, he told me I need to eat fruit for breakfast. And I'm like, well, why are you listening to this dude that like clearly doesn't know what he's talking about and not me, but like, I just, I love that he's, that Armand is married to a registered dietitian. <laughs> it's, and he calls it like, he literally says it, it's his worst nightmare because he is, he, his diet is a hot mess. But again, like he does like fruit. So of course he's like, oh, I can do fruit for bread. But then the the one fruit he brought up, the guy was like, no, you might as well be eating a potato. And I'm like, and I told Armand, I'm like, I don't even know like what that means. But he was like, yeah, he was definitely saying it in a negative way. Like no to bananas. And I'm like, Armand, it's fine to eat a banana for breakfast. I wouldn't just eat a banana. I would. And again, I, I would encourage you to have a balanced breakfast. And again, I've said that to him for years. Like you need to be eating a balanced breakfast. Um, but I just, yeah, yeah, I, I love, don't you wish that you could just sit in somebody's brain for just a minute? Oh my God. Right. It would be terrifying half the time, but I'm picturing, um, at the risk of dating myself, did you, have you, have you seen Men in Black? I definitely have. Yes. Thank you. You know, okay. If I give away any part of the movie, (laughs) People, the movie's like 57 years old at this point. So right, get over yourself. So, yeah, get, no, the spoilers don't matter. So, you know, when uh, they find like the prince or whatever who says the galaxy is on Orion's belt, and they so they open up the tall white dude and they open up his face, and the little the little alien prince guy is in his head, right? Like, like it's a spaceship and he was driving it around, right? I almost feel like, could we get in people's heads like that, <laughs> right? And drive them around for a week and help them get over some of these hurdles and help them like kind of triage things a little bit more directly. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just, I love that's, I, I'm sure that's happened before. I can't think of an example with us, but, um, I know it's happened with me. I've been, I've been the one who's done this too. And I've tried to remember what the example was, but like Mike told me something numerous times. And then like two years later, so like, you know, on a webinar or a YouTube video, somebody says, oh, you should do this. And I tell Mike, like, it's new news. Like, oh, I think right. I'm going to start doing this. And he's like, God damn it. Right. But exactly. he's done it to me too. Right. Oh, I wish I remember the example because it was a funny one. Um, but it's, yours is pretty hilarious that, again, this doctor who, again, has probably had zero or oh. perhaps one nutrition well, class in medical I, school a thousand years ago. Can, like he's teaching Armand about nutrition and I, he's literally married to you. I, uh, Armand also told me that this man said he eats like, I guess he eats the berries for breakfast and then like something really small for lunch. Uh, I think he said a protein shake, a protein shake for lunch and then just vegetables and like a protein for dinner. So I'm like, oh, that sounds terrible and like not adequate. So, um, but I will say, so he said, but last night we ate a full Dairy Queen ice cream cake. The doctor confessed this with him and his wife, I guess, like went to town because they had it left over or something. Maybe it wasn't the full cake, but he's like, and those are expensive and I didn't want that to go to waste. And I'm like... <laughs> Okay. So okay. like this this doctor sounds a little bit unhinged. <laughs> Again, I'm all for maybe some some dairy queen ice cream cake. I'm not I'm not a prude to that, but all like, at once. But like how do you go from like this hyper, like crazy restrictive to just, you know, like a huge amount of ice cream cake that you're having for dinner? Because again, like you don't want to bite the cost 
of the ice cream cake. I'm like, can't we just like give it away or something? I, I don't put know. Put it in the freezer? I'm pretty sure right. you could just put it in the freezer and it would be fine for I, at least a day or two. I think Armand needs to find a new doctor, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, it's, what's a amusing little note here too is like, it the way the doctor presented that information, I'm like, can I have a banana? No, you might as well eat a potato. Right. You can tell that he's demonizing carbs. Oh, 100%. Right? Like, Unhinged. He's eating yeah. the uh, low glycemic fruit and then a protein shake and then a big pile of vegetables and protein. So I bet you anything in his head, he's like, oh, it was the carbs making me fat right. and I lost all this weight because I went low carb. But it sounds like he's creating a huge caloric deficit. Right. Right? Like a Dixie cup of berries. Right. One protein shake and then a plate full of vegetables and protein. This guy's probably getting like seven, eight hundred calories a day. Right. But then he's like, oh, it was the carbs all along. And well, it's like, and you know, like what's going to happen with this guy is like because it's so depleted and like it's such a stressor on his body, like eventually when he eats normally, it's the same thing that happens with most crash diets his metabolism basically is downregulated because it's not fueled properly. It's in a budgeted state. And then he's just going to gain all this weight back. That's what and typically that's going to prove to him that it was the carbs all right. along. And then he's going to go back on the, and again, it, it's just, but anyway, Armand's trying to lose a little bit of weight. So he's seeking advice from everyone, I guess, except me. <laughs> oh, oh, are we putting this out there? Everybody can comment on YouTube. Uh, yeah. Their, their what is your, what's your weight loss advice? And Armand's going to be all for it. And Armand tends to be a little unhinged with how he goes about <laughs> his weight. all or nothing. He's ve- and I'm the opposite. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna like play tennis two or three times a week. He's like, I'm gonna work out every day. And so like for seven days straight, he's like, I'm so sore. And then he doesn't work out for <laughs> three more weeks. And then he's like, man, I need to get back into the gym. So it's like literally just that cycle over and over again. And then he also goes to extremes where he's like, I'm just not gonna eat breakfast and lunch. I'm like, Armand, you have to eat. Breakfast, like uh, you're just going to the absolute extremes, and it's why you've never been able to stick with, yeah, stick well, with anything. That's so common. I've seen right. that. I mean, I've seen that in my family. I've seen that in you know my personal life and my professional life. But it, yeah, we we could get into the psychology of this even at another <laughs> right. time. Right, we should have Armand on. That yeah, <laughs> we sh- we should eventually do an episode where it's both of us and both of our spouses and. Yeah. Or, no, better yet, we take a day off and we make the husbands host a podcast oh my God. together. How Armand would honestly, like, would that be? Armand would thrive with that. Armand would be thrilled. I think Mixmaster Mike, I, if I had to guess, I think that he prefers to be behind the scenes <laughs> yeah, rather than up front. So I think Mike would be mortified. Oh but uh, yeah, Armand would be in his glory because he's extrovert enough to handle it. But Armand um, wanted to be like a newscaster at one point. And so, again, his personality types just wants to be in front of the camera for sure. Yeah. But weirdly, he likes all the behind the camera stuff too. So, okay, well, I, uh, yeah, it. We'll have to have him on the pod one of these days. Yes, I'm sure we we'll will. have some amusing tidbits from mm-hmm. from uh, from our mod side of things. Uh, I think it would take a pretty big bribe to get Mike on here, but yeah, we'll see. Um, let me think. Let me think. Back to mucus. Briefly, I think, um, I think one other thing I'll mention as like maybe more of an advanced strategy that I've seen that's helpful just with kind of regulating the immune response a bit would be SBI, um, hmm. which is serum bovine immunoglobulins. Um, there's actually a number of studies because of the enterogam. It's like a pharma. I think it's technically listed as like a medical food, um, but they use it a lot for IBD. Um so most of the research is in IBD, um, and, and again, I've used it with IBS too and seem to like it. But I think, again, it does a pretty good job at helping reduce some of the inflammatory stuff that's going on um, from a gut lining standpoint. Go ahead. Out of curiosity with that, because I think you've used this more than I have. I've only mm-hmm. dabbled with it. Do you find that it's more helpful for one presentation or another like would you be more inclined to use this with somebody who has a lot of like systemic inflammatory stuff 
gut in, inflammatory stuff like pain, cramping, uh, um, hypersensitivity kind of stuff in the gut, or like diarrhea or constipation? Or do you think it's it's broadly yeah, I, helpful? I would say, again, I've seen it be helpful. I, I, I like it a lot for hypersensitivity and pain. Um, I've seen it help um, with those issues. I would say I've seen it be helpful in constipation, but I, if I had to pick one or the other, I think diarrhea, it seems to really help diarrhea in particular. Um, so again, if I had to choose one or the other, that's the one that I would like, if someone has a lot of diarrhea as their primary symptom, and there seems to be some inflammation going on and like hypersensitivity, I'd probably, that would be the, someone who I would think SBI for more than maybe someone struggling with constipation. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to confirm what I was thinking because that was kind of what I had in my brain as well, that it would probably be most helpful for like pain and sensitivity and that sort of symptomology and, and a little, and probably more so for diarrhea versus constipation. Um, but yeah, thank, thank you for that. Cause I actually, <laughs> I think I had that written down somewhere to ask you one of these days, cause it came up briefly on the FODMAP Freedom Q&A last week, I think. And I kept meaning to ask you that. And it dovetailed perfectly into this conversation. Whoa, How beautiful excellent. was that? Serendipitous. Uh, but yeah, I like that for an advanced strategy, especially because the SBI products, like I know SBI Protect from Orthomolecular, like that's one. Um, they are a little bit more on the expensive side in the grand scheme of things versus, you know, a probiotic or a vitamin D supplement right. or the nutritional intervention. Well, so I like that the more expensive thing is kind of presented as a right <laughs> advanced. Well, and I will say too, I, I think colostrum has IgG in it. So, and, and I should say immunoglobulins in it. Um, so, and some people do totally fine with dairy. And so if sometimes I'll start with that too, some people actually prefer colostrum over SBI. And I think there's a couple different reasons for that, but I do think that it's a cheaper option. So it's something you could try. And there's actually, they used to have it. I don't know if they still do it, but I typically have used Sovereign Laboratories as the colostrum brand that I use. And they used to have, they used to send bags of samples for free. And I think I had contacted them uh, like two years ago or something. And I don't think they do that anymore. Okay. So maybe they, they got rid of that. But they do have small travel bags that are like $10 or $13 or something like that. Mm. And it has enough in there that you could probably try it out for like 10 days. At least you could know if you tolerated it well. Um, you could potentially get symptom benefit in that short of a time. Um, usually, I think it's a good amount that you could try and see how you do with it. But that's something that I will do. If people are pretty sensitive to dairy, I might more so lean on the SBI route. <clears throat> but, you know, if someone's not, I might choose colostrum because there's SBI in it. There's also other things in colostrum too. Like there's proline rich peptides and different things <clears throat> that seem that could be beneficial to lactoferrin, stuff like that. So, um, you know, there, there could be some other things that are nice about colostrum and it's at a cheaper price point. It's yeah. still not like crazy cheap. I would say like a bag of colostrum Maybe that lasts a month, might be like $35 to $40, but that's more consistent with maybe like a probiotic. Versus the SBI thing. Like I think the orthomolecular product, I want to say it's like $50 or $60 per bottle, if oh, I the, remember correctly. The, it, no, it's more than that. I think the, the, more, the SBI Protect is like, depending on how often you do it, but like if you use the actual like grams that are most of the studies, which is five grams, like it's like 120 for a month. Oh, okay. So maybe I was thinking of the jar and then you would need multiple be, jars. It might be a little month. cheaper. I, Cause again, like there's a discount in my full script. It might be slightly different. I, I can't remember, but it's over a hundred dollars for yeah. sure. Yeah. So, so colostrum could be a good thing. And right. like you said, it has immunoglobulins in it. It's not the same thing as serum derived because that right. serum is blood. So right. it's, it's, it's milk derived. Yeah. Serum derived versus colostrum derived going to be a bit different, but it does have immunoglobulins. And like you said, the other kind of things like lactoferrin. So it could be 
maybe even a little bit more holistic even at, right. in addition to being a cheaper price point. Um, but yeah, you know, I think that, you know, to kind of summarize this, this episode now, there are a lot of really valid reasons why the dude with the bazooka are, are going crazy right now. <sighs> and a lot of people have a very sad shack of a house and an army of dudes with bazookas going nutso and an army of people at their front door banging on their door. And it, you know, one of the most foundational things we could do is build that fence. And again, like we're like a broken record, right. the two of us, right? Because again, it goes back to the same unglamorous stuff that we've been talking about for how many episodes now, right? 167. Dial in your nutrition, get enough sleep, manage your freaking stress, like move your body. It's it's not rocket science, but the implementation can be very difficult. So that's what I would say. That's a really good summary for what we talk about. The concepts are not rocket science, but the implementation is where people get stuck. Right. And that's where they oftentimes need the help or the coaching or the perspective shift. Right. right? So I agree. You know, go forth. Build yourself a fence, build yourself a house, chill out the dudes with the bazookas, and maybe get you some pups to put out on the on the outskirts of that fence and protect it even further. And then I think you will find that your sad shack becomes a beautiful house before you know it. And isn't that the goal? <laughs>